All right, cool. I think we are on. Let me mute myself on Facebook. Should I share my screen now? Um, I'll do a brief intro first. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think we're on. Yeah. yeah, just give me the give me the cue to share my screen. All right, welcome back everyone to Ask a Scientist with the Asheville Museum of Science. My name is Abby and we have a really special guest today, Dr. David Evans. He is a leading paleontologist who has, uh, he oversees the research at the Royal Ontario Museum in uh, Toronto. And he is a chair of vertebrate paleontology at the University of Toronto. To date, he has discovered 10 new dinosaur species um, during expeditions in Africa, Mongolia, and Canada. Um, and you can kind of get a glimpse of some of those by watching the Netflix series Dino Hunt, and uh, you'll see David on Dino Hunt. So I'm very excited. We are so lucky to have you as a speaker today, and we will just pass it off to you. Awesome. All right, great. Thanks, Abby. This is, uh, this is very cool to be able to talk to a group down in North Carolina today and tell them about how we dig up dinosaurs. I'm going to share my screen here. Hopefully this works. All right, so today I'm going to give you a little insight into the work we do as paleontologists, finding and getting the fossils out of the ground and taking them to the point where uh, you see them on display in a museum like um, the Asheville Museum of Science or the Royal Ontario Museum or anywhere in the world. And it takes a little bit of luck to find a good specimen. Uh, and it also takes a lot of hard work to get it out of the ground, reconstruct it and get it up in a museum for everyone to enjoy. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about who I am. Uh, as Abby said, I'm a curator at the Royal Ontario Museum and a professor at the University of Toronto, uh, both um, big institutions, the biggest of their kind in Canada, but a very long history of working with dinosaurs over 100 years. Uh, my experience working with dinosaurs, I got my start in uh, Alberta, Canada, the famous fossil beds there. Uh, in fact, uh, almost 10% of the world's dinosaurs are found in Alberta. It's a very special place. And I was very lucky to sort of grow up there uh, and become a scientist. I started digging dinosaurs 21 years ago, and I have never missed a field season digging in Alberta or Montana. But it looks like this year, due to the crisis, will be my first missed field season in 21 years. And I've been talking to some of my colleagues who, uh, of, of course, can't get out as well. And uh, my good friend, Jack Horner, who some of you may know, he said that it was his first season in 50 years that he wouldn't be out into the field. So it's a bit of a sad um, summer for many of uh, us dinosaur paleontologists. Uh, but it's actually positive in one sense is that um, there'll be more erosion. And when we get out next summer, Hopefully there'll be more fossils to find and big discoveries to be made. So in my 21 years of being a paleontologist, I've been lucky to work all over the world. As Abby said, I've dug up specimens in um, Africa, in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. I've done expeditions to South America, the American West, Canada, and I've even been to the high Arctic looking for dinosaurs, uh, which is very cool. And I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, and I've named over 10 new species of dinosaurs. Some of them I've dug up myself, uh, some of them I've worked with collaborators on, uh, but it's really one of the funnest parts of the job to get to name some dinosaurs. So here's a few dinosaurs that I've had, uh, had some luck to be able to work on uh, and help discover over the years. Uh, Wendy Ceratops pinhornensis is one of the oldest members of the Triceratops family. It's known from these wicked curly Q hooks and horns that come off the back of the frill. And this dinosaur, I spent about, geez, five years digging up in Southern Alberta, and it's featured on the Dino Hunt TV program. Um, and I got to name this dinosaur, and I named it after the person who discovered the first fossils. Uh, this is Wendy Sloboda. She is a um, ranch, uh, ran a, a rancher down in, in Southern Alberta and she is a fossil bloodhound. She can sniff these out in the hills. She is absolutely one of the very best dinosaur hunters in the world. Um, she's discovered over 3000 specimens at the Royal Terrell Museum alone. And she is probably the coolest person I know. Um, she's been uh, finding dinosaurs since she was 16. 
And obviously she marches to the beat of her own drum. And when I told her I uh, named this dinosaur after her, um, the next uh, summer I came out, she jumped out of her dino digger truck and showed me her arm. And she said, her, she's completely covered in tattoos, but she said, I was saving this part for my dinosaur. I knew I would get one eventually. And so she got a tattoo of uh, the life reconstruction of Wendy Ceratops on her arm. And, and uh, I could not think of a person who, who deserves a dinosaur more than Wendy. And she, uh, she found the first fossils of this and they led to a really amazing um, uh, early horned dinosaur. And so we named it after her. Another dinosaur that I've had the pleasure of working with and naming is the last raptor dinosaur. Um, this is a Curaptor temertiorum. Uh, this is found in the Hell Creek Formation at 66 million years old. Um, this uh, Velociraptor-sized um, raptor uh, is known for its uh, wicked teeth um, that are ridged from top to bottom in addition to being serrated. It's quite a close relative of Velociraptor. And this was found in the same rocks as the famous Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops. So this was a big honor for me and my career to actually name the raptor that lived with T-Rex and Triceratops. Uh, raptor fossils are extremely rare uh, because uh, they are like a bird's bones. Uh, they have uh, hollow bones, they're very delicate, they're quite small, and uh, they barely uh, survive um, the fossilization to the process. And so we don't have very many good fossils of these dinosaurs. Um, so to find a good specimen uh, and work on it was uh, definitely a pleasure. And most recently, and this uh, uh, is a dinosaur you may have heard of, it got quite a bit of attention uh, in the press, is a dinosaur that me and my colleague, uh, Victoria Arbor named Zool after uh, the movie monster in Ghostbusters. Uh, this is based on one of the most beautiful and best preserved dinosaur skeletons anywhere in the world. Uh, it's also the most complete tail clubbed ankylosaur, and it's the first one to be found with a complete tail and a complete skull. And we thought that that head had a lot of similarities to the movie monster Zool uh, from uh, Ghostbusters, uh, including the sort of the nostrils that face forward and this like rugose, wrinkly um, snout and forehead, this broad uh, face, and these horns coming out from the back of the eyes. Um, the only thing that was really missing is that our Zool was a plant eater and didn't have the sharp teeth of the monster. But there was enough similarities um, that we thought we could have fun with it. And uh, we named it Zool. So it's not just a movie monster anymore. It's actually the name of a real species of dinosaur. And to give you an idea of just how special uh, this dinosaur is, this is a photograph of the back of the dinosaur being, uh, this is from National Geographic. Um, it was featured about a year ago uh, in the breakthrough section of National Geographic. And you can see all the armor of this dinosaur is preserved in place. And actually what you're looking at here um, is not the bone, but everything you're seeing here is the skin. Um, below the big spikes that have these ridges on them, uh, there's uh, bony plates, but everything you're seeing here is the preserved skin. So um, actually having all those bony plates in place with the skin on them and a complete uh, skeleton of one of the rarest dinosaurs uh, was definitely a huge thrill. Um, so all of, you know, it's been a wonderful uh, 20 years working on dinosaurs for me and all these new dinosaurs that I'm showing here and basically every dinosaur that you uh, see in a museum or hear about in the news, it all starts in the same place. Um, they all start in the field and we have to, they have to be discovered and then they have to be dug up. And I think there's quite a few misconceptions here about how paleontologists go about digging up dinosaurs. And I think many of them spread from uh, or start uh, from this sort of iconic scene in Jurassic Park. So I'm going to play this for you and talk over it. This is the, the start of the first movie. And uh, they're uncovering a raptor dinosaur in the field. And you might remember me saying raptor dinosaurs are extremely rare. They are extremely rare because their bones are so delicate and they're such small animals generally. And they are some of the most prized dinosaurs that we would ever find. Uh, computers. Feelings mutual. Yeah, I think 
So here they're brushing the sand away from perfect raptor skeletons, which almost never happens. And here they're using ground penetrating radar to find the bones in the ground. And this scene really stuck with me where Grant says, she bring an immediate return. She the radar into the ground and the bone bounces the image back. Bounces it back. This new program is incredible. In more years development and we won't even have to dig anymore. There's the fun in that. I agree. I mean, what is the fun in that? Digging is the most fun part of being a paleontologist. Um, but, you know, the, the truth is that that movie is over 25 years old uh, and they're promoting a ground penetrating radar type technology that you can see into the ground. Um, but that technology has not improved uh, with respect to digging dinosaurs and it's never used. Um, how we go about finding dinosaurs and digging them up, up is very different from that scene in the movie. Uh, we don't use ground penetrating radar or anything like that. Um, all uh, dinosaur discoveries start with a process uh, that we call prospecting, and we find dinosaurs with our eyes. So it's called prospecting because uh, it's borrowed from the sort of gold miners term, um, but the fossils are our gold here, they're our treasure. And uh, we go out into areas that have rock of the right age uh, and the right environments exposed uh, and are actively eroding, and we walk. And we walk miles and miles and miles looking for fragments of dinosaur bones that might lead to a skeleton that's still in the ground. Finding a good skeleton, like you see in the movie, is exceptionally rare and takes a lot of prospecting if you're, if, uh, if, uh, you're going out to find one specifically. And this is typically how we find a dinosaur in the field. Uh, we find a few bones, that are eroding out of the hillside. Uh, and we gravity is our friend here and erosion is our friend. We actually look for not whole bones on the surface, um, but fragments of bones that have washed down a hill. And that's usually our first clue uh, that we might have a dinosaur nearby. And you can see in the bottom of the screen, um, little chunks of dinosaur bones. And uh, we followed those uh, up the hill. We found them at the bottom of a hill and we found them the bone that they were weathering off of. And so now we know that there's a layer that produces dinosaur bones. And we have a look around and we see if there's any other bones that are coming out. Uh, we use what's on the surface to evaluate uh, what species it is um, and the rarity of the find, whether we have uh, multiple bones that might be from a single individual bone bed or so on. Um, but this is sort of how we generally find dinosaurs in the field, very different from the movie. Dinosaur bones are found um, in different ways. We're used to seeing the full skeletons on the documentaries and in the movies because they're the most spectacular finds uh, and they're the most exciting finds. And they're also the most intuitive for us to understand. Um, but the most common things that we find in the field, even in the very best places to find dinosaurs like Montana or Utah or, uh, or Alberta where I'm from um, is we find bones as isolated elements uh, and often teeth because the animals, uh, dinosaurs were like sharks. They replaced uh, their teeth uh, every few months to every few years. And um, those teeth are made of enamel, the hardest tissue in the body and they survive quite well. So we actually find quite a few dinosaur teeth but most of them are shed teeth and just isolated, not attached uh, to the jaws. Another common way that we find uh, dinosaur bones are part of bone beds. And these are actually a really great place uh, for, for young paleontologists to cut their teeth on dinosaur digging. Um, these are massive accumulations of, of bones that are disarticulated from multiple individuals and all jumbled up together. Um, some bone beds can have a relatively low density, like a couple of bones a square meter. And then uh, other bone beds, uh, like those that uh, belong to horn dinosaurs and duckbill dinosaurs, um, they can have dozens to hundreds of bones per square meter. That means if you get to work in a bone bed, you're guaranteed to find something new. Uh, and you can have a lot of practice digging up uh, bones, which is important for, for students of paleontology. Uh, but these particular deposits um, 
have given us important insight into the social lives of dinosaurs. This is a, a horned dinosaur bone bed of an animal called Centrosaurus, uh, which is a, a cousin of Triceratops, a large horned dinosaur. Uh, and this gives you an idea of just how dense these accumulations are. Um, this bone bed uh, that we're digging up in this example is uh, about the size of a football field. Uh, there's about 50 to 100 bones stacked on top of each other uh, per square meter. Um, in the bone bed, there's actually more bone than there is rock um, surrounding the bone. It's really incredible. And the interpretation uh, that scientists have come up for these sites, that they're dominated by the bones of a single species, um, is that these, this is the remains of a, of a herd that was struck down in a coastal flood. And so they've provided us with evidence that dinosaurs like wildebeest or, or caribou today um, lived in large social groups. And that's consistent with the ornamented skulls, which were certainly social signals. Um, and they lived in mixed groups uh, with uh, relatively young juveniles as well as old adults. And so this would have provided safety in numbers to the vulnerable uh, young and old uh, as well. So a good strategy that evolved here in terms of social behavior uh, and something that we see today and may, might not typically associate with dinosaurs. So bone beds are really interesting. Uh, not only do they give us that sample of variation in a species and, and, and examples of bones at different stages of development, uh, if they're uh, mixed faunal, so there's different animals that are mixed in, um, it can give us a snapshot about what was living in the ecosystem. So they're very useful uh, deposits. Um, but maybe a bit less glamorous than the third and, and rarest type of dinosaur find. These are articulated skeletons. And these are the ones that we see, of course, in, in the movies like Jurassic Park and, and in the documentaries. Uh, but these are exceptionally rare. The reason why these are, are so rare is that in order for the shin bone to be connected to the knee bone, connected to, be, to the thigh bone, um, those bones have to be connected by soft tissue in life. And that means the skeletons of these animals had to be buried relatively quickly before the flesh and the connective tissue decayed um, and the bones were scattered around by predators, for instance, uh, or uh, were moved around by, uh, by, by, by flooding waters or trampled by other dinosaurs. I mean, if you think uh, to watching some of those nature documentaries, when, uh, uh, when you are a kid, or I still watch them, uh, where you have a, a lion or a hyena take down a wildebeest, um, it's like within an hour, um, all the bone, the, the carcass is dismembered, all the bones are, are dispersed, and it's just nothing but a big blood stain on the savanna. Um, you know, these dead dinosaurs would have been an all you can eat buffet for all of the different predators around at different sizes. Um, and getting a skeleton that isn't disrupted by, by predators um, and is buried rapidly with the skin and connective tissue still on is an exceptionally rare event. And that's why these skeletons are so prized by paleontologists, um, but it's also why they're, they're so rare. So if we want to find good dinosaur bones, where do we look? And yeah, I think, Dr. Evans, yeah. I'm going to stop sure. you real quick because I think we might have lost connection to Facebook.